What is up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Thirsty Thursdays, a Brewing at McEwen podcast. I'm your host tonight, uh, John Kaplan, and I'm here with El Prez and my co-host tonight, Mark Giardino. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. we got a pretty packed segment uh, this episode, but before we get started, I just wanted to throw out a couple of reminders. This weekend's tailgate against North Carolina A&T due to some other on-campus um, events has been canceled, and we are sorry for any inconvenience this may cause, but a, a big bulk of our normal crew is going to be out at the USF Gala. I hope everyone's safe out there and they have a good time. We will be... Uh, we will be resuming our normal uh, tailgate schedule as posted. Um, also, whatever at whatever platform you are listening to this on, don't forget to like and follow. And uh, if you like what we're doing or if you have any suggestions, don't forget to uh, let us know how we're doing in the comments. Uh, so this week, we have a pretty loaded segment, as I said before. Um, we're going to start with a midweek recap. We had two uh, games out in Duval County against UNF and Jacksonville University. Uh, then we're going to swing it to a weekend preview uh, against the previously mentioned North Carolina A&T University. Uh, round three is going to be some player spotlights, and round four is going to be the season outlook moving forward. So, Mark, uh, what did you uh, what did you think about the uh, two games against UNF and Jacksonville University this uh, this these past two days? Yeah, I thought it was it was uh it was great actually. You know, I I really thought coming into these two games that it was going to be very important for the Bulls to get a couple of wins, especially coming into the week at 500. Our record was 5 and 5, and I was tweeting out before each game, you know, it's important to win these midweeks, get your record back to a winning record and start building on the winning season that everybody wants to have. The players, coaches, fans, everybody wants a winning season, of course. So this was a great opportunity to get on that track and they definitely did um you know looking at tuesday against unf the bulls ended up winning by a total score of 17 to 5 which was uh pretty crazy uh the this game was actually tied going into the top of the eighth and the bulls scored 12 runs in the top of the eighth and ended up winning 17 to 5 and also looking at the jacksonville game that was an interesting game as well. Uh, just kind of back and forth the entire game. And going into the top of the ninth, the Bulls were actually trailing 11 to 10. And uh, luckily we scored six runs on the top of the ninth and ended up winning that game 16 to 12. So uh, definitely midweek madness. Uh, you know, when you have teams that are playing five games in six days, I feel like, you know, that's going to put a lot of strain on the pitching staff. Um, you know, overall, our pitching staff held up fairly decently. Uh, five runs the first day, given up, and then 12 the second day could have been a little better. But, um, you know, before I get more into that, we can kind of just kind of look at the box score, and I'll kind of just, you know, react to, to what I see when I look at this. Um, from a hitter standpoint, on Tuesday night, um, we had a crazy performance from Bobby Bozer. He had seven RBIs in one game, went two for four. Um, another great performance from that day was John Montez going four for five with three RBIs. And another thing that jumps out to me, too, is uh, Drew Brutcher having three walks. Uh, I believe he leads the nation in walks, or he's very close to leading the country in walks. Um, so that's pretty cool to see. And then from a pitching standpoint, uh, it, there were some positives and negatives. I think a positive is just the fact that Lawson Gailey came back. Uh, he was our lowest ERA pitcher last season. So, and he missed the first two or three weeks of the season with an injury. So just to get him back and just get him some innings is was great. Uh, obviously it wasn't his best performance, but I mean, you know, anytime you're coming back from a long layoff, it's a little adjustment. Um, we got to see a few other arms as well. I think what stands out to me is the, the season debut of Nick Pineda. Uh, he's a transfer from Hillsborough Community College, and uh, he really had a great debut. He went two innings, uh, no earned runs, only one strikeout. I wonder why we hadn't seen him till now. I, I guess maybe uh, 
just didn't have the right opportunity or maybe he was hurt. I'm not sure. But um, not only did he put up good stats, two innings, but I actually did get to sporadically peek in and watch the game, even though it was during a work day here and there, peek in here and there. And I have to say, like, I really like what I saw from Nick Pineda, like his arm action is so fluid and he just seems very comfortable on the mound and he just has a really good presence out there. So it was, it was impressive to see what he did. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of my, my thoughts. Oh, also, we also saw the debut of Corey Kling on, on Tuesday. Uh, he's a freshman from Boca Raton, two thirds of an inning and uh, no runs allowed. So that's a positive as well. Um, so just thinking about this game, John, uh, what are your, yet yeah, do you have any reactions or thoughts about this one? Um, I'll kind of group my reactions for uh, both games. Um, I will back you up on the Drew Brooker stat. He is leading the nation in walks with 19, um, leading the second place is at 18. I think that's, that's insane. It's a stat that I noticed early on, uh, even in the first week of play. Um, and also uh, a little bit, I mean, so – Bobby Bonds is back, and that couldn't be at a, a more welcome site. Uh, Johnny Montez was one of my guys who I had as my top three trending up, um, and he's just continued to absolutely put on. Eric Snow was also he is uh, also playing really well, but he was one of my guys trending up. And um, also, so a common trend that I'm seeing is is uh, with these two past weeks. We've, we've been getting tested in the midweek with, with depth and uh, we're not, we've, we've preached the importance of having a, a set starting rotation, but I think we have to kind of temper our expectations because um, a quality start in the MLB and a quality start in NCAA baseball isn't always the same. Uh, we're saying we want six to seven innings from these guys, but how many games can we think of where we went out and saw the pitcher go six or seven innings i think we if we can realistically start hoping for five from our starters and keeping keeping the opponents run run totals low uh we can start depending on some of these key cogs that we've really discovered in our bullpen over the past week and a half i mean just what you've mentioned today and what we've seen over the past like i said week and a half two weeks uh with spray you know and 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 a myriad of other performances you know big newt is another arm that i really love uh joey bellini's gonna have a bigger role moving forward you know uh like you said the emergence of nick Pineda, um corey cling and also i can't stress enough the the importance of getting lost and gaily back it did start out the season banged up but i think those are pretty much the common themes that i've seen i, I love the lefty gang Still firing on all on all cylinders. Eric Snow starting to take into his uh, leadership role and starting to produce. And uh, I just really like where this team is going. I want to see us continue it against a pretty good NT uh, baseball team coming in this weekend. Yeah, for sure. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, like trying to really round out this pitching staff and maybe kind of think about, you know, I, I actually had to think like back to 2021 when the team made the super regional. And I also think to myself, that was the last time that Billy Mole was the pitching coach of the team. And you actually are starting to see some really good performance metrics kind of like going in some ways similar to 2021. Our, our team ERA is, is lower uh, than it was the last couple of years right now. Um, so that's trending in the right direction. I think the only thing that uh, still needs to improve a little bit is is the walks. But to be honest, uh, the last two days, the 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 midweeks, uh, to to be able to only walk four people on Tuesday, and then I want to say three people on Wednesday to walk three and a half per game is actually not a bad rate. Uh, I get concerned when you start going above four and a half you know, one every other inning, but three and a half is really not a bad rate. That's actually the rate that the 2021 super regional pitching staff had three and a half per nine. Um, so that's really not bad, especially when you think about being able to minimize walks during a midweek is just, it's just a really actually a underrated skill for a team because 
you look at the fact that we won both of these games. Let's look at the flip side of this, right? So what did UNF do on Tuesday? They they had 14 walks of us, okay? And then Jacksonville on Wednesday, they, they walked us eight times. So our opponent walked us over 20 times over a two-day span, uh, and we only walked our opponent, I think, seven times. And so it's really no uh, like miracle that we won, honestly. It's like, you know, I think it's a really good sign that our pitching staff, even when we're in the midweek, even when we're stretched thin, still can put it in the strike zone and still can generally control the opponent to to an extent that that's needed. Um, but yeah, just looking at the Wednesday box score real quick, a couple other quick reactions. Um, I think what stands out from Wednesday's box score is <laughs> – Bobby Poser has six RBIs. He had 13 RBIs in two days. I don't even know when the last time that has happened. And then he also hit for the cycle, which a bull hasn't done that in over 20 years. And they're still trying to dig up uh, when the last one actually occurred. Um, Jackson Mayo continued his hot hitting. He went three for five with three RBIs. Uh, Joaquin Monke had a pretty good game, two for three with two RBIs. And uh, Ben Rosenblum actually came in off the bench and had a clutch hit in the ninth inning, I think, to tie the game. Uh, so that was pretty great to see. And then from a pitching standpoint that day, we saw a lot of arms. Uh, we saw Dominic Madonna make, I want to say, his second or third third start of the season. Uh, he got roughed up a little bit, ended up giving six earned runs and three and a third. Um, but he kept the ball in the zone, three strikeouts, one walk. Um, just a rough day, but I, I still feel pretty optimistic about him going forward. He's a fifth-year senior with a really good track record. And then I think another thing that stands out uh, from Wednesday is just Kyle Scrape is just turning out to be a really important part of this bullpen. Uh, he he had went one and two-thirds with three strikeouts and no walks. He's that left-handed uh, relief pitcher who transferred in from Old Dominion University but he actually originally started his career at Hills Hillsborough Community College. Um, so he's actually originally from Tampa, went up to Old Dominion, and now he's back with us. And uh, he's really uh, impressive to me so far. Uh, we also got to see a clean inning from Riley Skeen, who picked up his first win of the season. So, uh, yeah, overall, I think um, a lot of good things occurred these last uh, couple games. But um you know, we want to keep that momentum going into this weekend. But before before we kick it to this weekend, do you have any uh, closing thoughts on the midweek, John? Uh, no, I just want to support the sentiment that we've been uh, calling for less walks. And it, I, I would say that that started against UCF. That series didn't end the way we wanted it to. Um, but each game, we'll, uh, we only walked three batters in each contest. So um, I think that um, the success of this team is going to begin and end with our pitching staff, both the rotation and our bullpen. And I can't stress the importance of eliminating, you know, preventable errors like bases on balls and uh, just giving them free bases. So uh, definitely, a, definitely a good point made there on, on less walks leading to better results in the end, for sure. Uh, let's go ahead and look towards uh, – this weekend series against uh, North Carolina A and T. Mark, what do you know about it? Uh, this this team coming into uh, Tampa this weekend. Yeah, this is a really interesting team. Actually, I I really didn't know much about them, or didn't really know much about the school uh, at all. But uh, doing some research, I mean, they're from Greensboro, North Carolina, which is kind of funny because the following weekend we're playing UNC Greensboro, so two teams in a row from Greensboro. Um, but uh, they are an HBCU, and they are actually the largest HBCU in the country. I didn't know that. And another interesting thing about them is uh, they have recently, in the last couple of years, moved up to a really, really good conference. Uh, a lot of HBCUs play in the SWAC, which uh, has a is a lower ranking a mid major conference, but they play in the Coastal Athletic Conference, which for a long time was known as the Colonial Athletic Conference. And last year, uh, this conference, the Coastal Athletic Conference, finished as the number two ranked mid-major conference in college baseball, only behind the Sun Belt. And that conference actually ended up in the RPI ranked ahead of the AAC. So they come from a good conference, for sure. 
And last year was only their first year in that conference. Uh, they had a losing record there, but um, they're doing a lot better this season. They have a 10 and two record this season. And they, they have a coach that's been there for a long time. I think it's like his 10th year there. So they have some good continuity and it seems like they're, um, you know, really starting to have a pretty good season. But the only thing I really stood out when I just kind of read about how they're doing so far this year is just they're, they're pitching really well. I mean, their team ERA right now is like 3.5. Uh, that's a big driver of their 10 and two record for sure. Um, nothing about their offense is really crazy. It, it's just to me like a decent offense. They're not, they don't really have a lot of power or home run hitters. Um, but you know, they can, they can make contact and maybe get some things going in that sense. But, um, yeah, I mean, anything that stands out to you about this team, John? All right. So, yeah, I, um, I noticed the same thing. Um, I didn't know much about this team coming in. And, uh, when I, when I took a deeper dive into their stats, they, they really are winging the ball pretty well. Um, they're, like you said, their team ERA is really low and it, and it seems like it's, it's coming from both sides. You know, their bullpen is, has kept them in games and sometimes their starters have, have been the, uh, the reasons they're winning, but nine and two isn't easy to do no matter what conference you play in. Uh, just to highlight one of their, uh, some of their pitching uh, in the starting rotation, they have a senior right-hander, uh, Coley Kilpatrick. It, um, he is currently, uh, he's currently holding a 1.2 VRA in 15, 15 innings pitch. He's only allowed two earned runs in that time uh, with a 16 to six. Strike to walk, strike out to walk ratio. Um, this is his second year with the team, and uh, last season he did not experience the same success. He was three and seven with a six point two ERA. So it's going to be interesting to see if this is a small sample size or if their starting rotation has really started to turn the corner. Because even with Evan Hart, they're probably their Saturday night guy. Um, he's got a low ERA, but. Uh, is a, a response from a 10.23 ERA in 12 appearances last season. So uh, early on, these, these uh, stats can be inflated, you know, just from small sample size. So it's going to be interesting to see how we fare against them. And um, to go along with some, some starting rotation successes that they've had, uh, they've got two guys out of the bullpen that have not allowed an earned run. I did not look at their, their updated stats against UNF. Uh, their midweek series game against UNF because they also faced off against them this week where they actually won 10 to five, I believe, uh, which is a pretty good win for, for this program. Um, but Brock Duff is a sophomore right-hand pitcher. And in the three appearances that he, he's come in, he's allowed obviously zero runs and one hit. And Angel Ortiz is another guy that caught my eye, junior right-handed pitcher, also zero earned runs over four pin appearances and uh, six innings pitch with a nine to three strikeout to walk ratio. These guys can really pitch. And um, I think that uh, if we do not watch out, this team could really surprise us, Mark. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, any team that has a team ERA of 3.5 through 12 games, uh, obviously is, is doing something right. Um, whether it be, I did get to see a little bit of video of their Friday night guy, Coley. I saw that on Twitter, Coley Kilpatrick, I think. And he doesn't look like physically imposing or like dominant from like a velo standpoint, but he seems like a guy that just knows how to pitch. Um, probably throws low nineties. I would think he's a right-handed pitcher. Uh, like you mentioned. Um, I think he'll present a challenge just from the sense that he, he's an experienced pitcher that can, Kind of, kind of move the ball around the zone, um, but uh, I think he's someone like that we should be able to handle, and that's their Friday night guy. So I mean, we'll, I'm not trying to say it's gonna, you know, he's not gonna be difficult, but I, I don't think we're gonna be looking at, you know, a case of like playing the Gators Friday night guy looking at 98 miles an hour. Um, but uh, it's it's gonna be um, it's gonna be a good matchup from a pitching standpoint, but also from a hitting standpoint, um, their best hitter right now is a actually a first baseman from Japan. Uh, he transferred in from another D1. I think he's a grad student there. And uh, he's really crushing it right now. He's hitting 412 for them. His name is Tatsunori Nagishi. Uh, he's got almost a 1200 OPS. Uh, so he's definitely crushing it. 
And then their catcher is actually probably the only guy on the team that I saw get some MLB draft hype before the season. Uh, his name is Canyon Brown. Uh, he's a catcher. I think junior or senior is OPS right now is 972 and supposedly has a pretty good arm that professional teams are interested in. And uh, given the fact that we have been stealing a lot of bases lately, I think we actually stole seven bases on Tuesday, which was pretty crazy. Um, you know, just something to watch. Like, does this Canyon Brown guy, like, is he that legit that he's going to be able to keep our running game in check? Or are we just that good at stealing bases now that it won't matter? I don't know. That's going to be interesting to see. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I really had about NCAT. Well, we're definitely looking forward to that series this weekend at the Reds. Uh, moving on, um, I wanted to go into round three where we go into some player spotlights of just recent trends who's, who's uh, coming into their own a little bit on uh, both sides of the ball. Um, Mark, I'll let you go ahead and start there, actually. Yeah, for sure, man. I think uh, what really stands out for me is that uh, two guys who really last season – I'll, I'll go. I'll, they're all they're all kind of different cases, right? I would say Jackson Mayo stands out the most for me uh, because he is leading our team in batting average and OPS. Um, he is a junior for us, and we talked a, a lot about him in the preseason, kind of knowing that you know what he did as a freshman, hitting nearly ten home runs. That's that's a signal, right? That this guy is got a lot of ability, you know, no, but not just anybody can come in as a freshman and hit 10 home runs at this level. But then last season, he uh, really did not have a good season. So, but we were still optimistic that he was going to have a good season. And now he's leading the team in average and OPS uh, Jackson Mayo center fielder from Jacksonville, really killing it right now. Um, and then another guy that is kind of a similar story in some ways is uh, John Montez. I mentioned before that, Last year, he started the season like really hot. He may have been like our best hitter in the first few weeks, but then he kind of tapered off. But now he's one of our best hitters again. Uh, 1,000 OPS, 372 batting average tied with Jackson Mayo. But I have a feeling that he's going to be able to sustain this more this time. He looks healthy. He looks very confident. His approach looks really even a little more mature than last season. Um, he seems to, to work a little deeper in counts and kind of just has a better feel, I think, for the strike zone. And he uh, he's really impressive so far. I think those are two guys that really stand out for me uh, so far. But uh, what what about for you, John? I think for me, um, the biggest one is Bobby Bozer. We talked about him last week a little bit, and um, I believe his average was hovering around 220. Um, we knew he, he's another one that we knew was, was going to turn it around, but I think the biggest difference has been the emergence of the home runs, uh, the power game in, uh, for Bozer. Uh, he's really just been killing it. Um, he hit for the cycle the other day, you know, um, he's got 21 RBIs, uh, which is, um, you take the top two on our team and that, and add their RBIs up, and that's how many they have combined. Um, he's just gone freak mode uh, in the past week, and that's something that I really have loved watching, and uh, you love to see it for the team. Also, um, I would have to agree with you um, on John Montez. He's uh, just really just continued his hot streak. Somebody that I saw um, – kind of run into a little bit of struggle like you said a couple weeks in and you really saw him change his approach at the plate um he really came out of it when he just laced one up the middle and and um anytime a hitter struggling you know i hear that they try to shoot middle simplify the game sort the swing and the more he's the more he's done that you, you've seen his his power stroke come back and he's hitting for average as well and he's not a bad guy to have on the base path so um those two guys are really making a difference for us yeah, big time. And then also got to shout out uh, Drew Butcher, like we mentioned before, leading the nation in walks and doing well from a hitting standpoint as well. 306 batting average, 1000 OPS. Um, Rafael Bencourt has cooled off a little bit from his extremely hot start, but 
we know what we all know what he's capable of and we're expecting a bounce back pretty soon as well and one last thing i would note is that slowly but surely eric snow is is starting to get it going um you know he's a guy that as a freshman came in with a had an amazing year last year made some freshman all-american teams and uh he's off to a little bit of a slow start but his ops is creeping up he's above 700 now um last week he was in the 600s uh he's just going to keep creeping up creeping up and ultimately you know he's he's one of the best players on this team so um it's good to see that he is uh getting into form a little bit more and then uh from a pitching standpoint uh some shout outs that i want to give there um obviously we know our our, our our friday and saturday guys have done pretty well so far this year uh, hunter mink 16 innings and two and, and jack siebert 15 innings both with eras under three but I think what stands out to me is that they both have uh, have good strikeout to walk ratios, which is really important. Um, Hunter Mink has only walked six in 16 innings and Siebert has only walked three in 15 innings. So that's big. And then I think who I would shout out uh, from a bullpen standpoint, uh, I would say uh, Kyle Scrape. We already mentioned he's got three and a third innings so far, five strikeouts and no walks. Um, all of his, I think two appearances so far have been really solid. And then additionally to that, um, I would say who someone who has actually crept up to be really productive, even though I think maybe his first outing, I can't remember which outing looked a little bit shaky, but he's been really, really good ever since that is Logan Beavis, um, the freshman from Orlando. Uh, he's already got five and a third inning across four relief appearances, and he has a 1.69 ERA with uh, three strikeouts. So it, the only thing that's been hampering him a little bit is his control. He does have seven walks, but basically when he is in the strike zone, he's practically unhittable. Uh, his batting average against is 125. So if uh, Logan Beavis can continue to improve his control, I think he has the ability to maybe blossom into a starting pitcher for this team uh, this season if it's needed. Uh, if not, uh, I think he's going to be obviously an important uh, bullpen piece. But but yeah, that's kind of my my shout outs on on the pitching end. Uh, anything? Any thoughts on your end, John? Um. Yeah, I want to just looking at um, the stats that you have pulled up here on the page. Um, there's some storylines that don't really fit. Uh, the numbers don't really fit the storyline is what I'm saying. Um, for there being such a discrepancy between Don Madonna's ERA and Matt Brown's ERA, I'm still not 100% sold on, on Matt Brown for an every week Sunday starter role. Um, he has showed up and showed out, but um, I think that small sample size is going to cause these uh, numbers to be a little bit skewed. I would say that Matt Brown passes in the eye test and the numbers test um, by quite a margin right now, but I would not be surprised if Madonna stuck his way back in uh, to the weekend roll rotation. Also, um, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Big Newt. You know, um, I've been in this corner since the get. Um, he is now carrying a 2.45 ERA with a whip right around one. Um, he's had four appearances this season. Um, and in 3.2 innings pitch, he has uh, only given up one earned run. Uh, he's run into some issues with walks, but I think that um, Newt could end up being a really, really key piece for us out of the bullpen. I agree with uh, your point on um, Logan Beavis. Uh, he does have the frame and the build and, and the stuff to uh, eventually work into that starter conversation. But I think right now we're so talent-rich and we're still in such a big evaluation phase that I don't see um, a new underclassman really making a name for themselves in our rotation this season. I think he could hold a pretty serviceable role out of the bullpen. Um, and... Yeah, I just really just want to see the continued trend of the, the decreasing the walk totals and and um, 
just keeping that going because that's only going to help us in the long run. I really like what Billy Mole's been doing with the pitching staff. I've shouted him out on Twitter a few, uh, several times. You're really starting to see um, shades of Mole, like you, <laughs> like you mentioned earlier, in, in, in our staff all around, and it's really exciting. Yeah, it is really exciting. I mean, right now, even after that game, which we just uh, – the Wednesday game where our <laughs> – Pitching staff was stretched out, obviously, five games in six days, but our team ERA is still 4.27, uh, which is more in line with the 2021 team, which was, I think, the high threes, uh, which is, you know, that's the last time Billy Mole was pitching coach, and now he's pitching coach again, and we're getting more in line with, you know, his influence uh, on a pitching staff, and that's really, really promising to see, like, like, like you mentioned, but... Yeah, I think that's it for player shout outs. Uh, you want to kick it to the last round, John? Uh, yeah, so for uh, the round four, the final round, we are looking at a little bit of a season outlook and kind of what we're looking to see from our Bulls staff the rest of the way. Um, we've kind of touched on it a little bit just throughout the episode, but um, Mark, I'm going to kick it to you again and uh, get us started on that one. Yeah, for sure. I think what I'm looking for for the rest of this, the rest of the season, at least for the foreseeable next couple of weeks, is uh, you got to keep the the winning trend uh, going, right? And um, I think it's important that we capitalize on this opportunity we have here in the next. Uh, I want to say next seven, next eight games. Actually, we have eight more games before the. Eight more games before conference play starts, and seven of those are at home. And they are all games that we have to be looking at. Like, we need to win, I would say, six out of these eight. I mean, you look at the level of competition, you look at the way our team is trending, and you look at the fact that we're at home. Um, For me, I'm looking for six wins at least in the next eight games. And that would actually put our team record i think at uh 13 and 7 maybe something like that and uh so that 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 would be pretty solid you know we'd be above 600 and i that's kind of what i'm looking for i think from a from a standpoint i mean we're we're playing nc and a, nc a and t this weekend like we mentioned and then the midweek next week is against university of maine who is uh and i'm not sure how how their season is going but unc greensboro uh the following weekend and then Florida Gulf coast on March 19th, a Tuesday. That's a team that uh, has just been struggling with their pitching. I feel like for years now, but they always are, have a good batting order. Um, so that'll be interesting. And then FAMU uh, who we generally play really well. So um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm looking for in the foreseeable future. John, what about you? I actually just realized that I will be working in Fort Myers when we're playing against uh, FDCU. So I might have to develop some cold symptoms that day, that night, to <laughs> work a night shift. Uh, no, I um, I've actually got a few things that I want to hit on. Um, from our starting rotation, what I'm looking for is um, eliminating that one bad inning. You know, um, continuing to uh, battle. You know, because they've endured some some interesting circumstances early on, um, and really just maintaining the the successes that we've had early on you know it's um it's easy to get carried away with with beat up statistics early on in the season but once once by the time conference play hits you're gonna see um you're gonna see these statistics become a little bit more true so if we can maintain a team era of around hanging around four you know by the end of the season if that's our team era we're going to be talking about being top three to four in the, in the conference, I would say overall. Um, so if we can maintain that, that would be amazing. Um, and from our, our, an offensive standpoint right now, we've got four eligible batters that are hitting above 300. We've got three eligible batters hitting with an OPS above a thousand. Um, and the trend of us, you know, using our athleticism because what our team is lacking this year, well, <laughs> before this offensive outburst in the midweek, you know, um, I would say 
from a consistent overall standpoint, I would say that we're missing a, a huge power piece that we've had in, in, in seasons past. So we are really starting to take advantage of the athleticism piece that, that in playing to our strengths. And I think that that just speaks more on, on the coaching staff and, and making sure that we go into every matchup prepared. Also, from a bullpen standpoint, what I would like to see is um, I would like to give a little shout out to Tanner Mink. Um, he's hit a couple rough patches and he's had a couple games where he's pitched really well, pitched the form. Um, I know that he expects a lot of himself and puts a lot of pressure on himself and he puts the work in. I know the results are going to come around. So I'd like to see uh, Tanner Mink take on that leadership role and be, a, be that front end bullpen guy that we know that he is. Um, because he is going to be absolutely crucial down the stretch. Um, and I would like to see, you know, um, kind of a rotation start to form, because I really think that what we're going to start seeing is a lot of games being late game battle of the bullpen. Who, it, it, who, can, who can win that, that game of three outs? You know, because it's going to be really important to come in and, and stop the bleeding if, if, if we have a bad inning or – you know, continue, continue to shut out and let our offense get us back in the game. You know, um, I would really like to just see people continue to establish themselves because right now we have so many different identities working um, on both sides of the baseball that um, I just really want to see the continued growth and success for sure. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, one thing I'll say in response to that, and you kind of touched on it, is the hitting right you know it's kind of funny how right now we're feeling great about the hitting because we just scored you know 30 something runs in two days but right before that we played against UCF and really struggled it during a three-game span to score any runs at all and part of that is the fact that um you know UCF has a lot of quality pitchers and they were well rested obviously that weekend and they were geared up and optimized to, you know, for three games. But, um, you know, I want to see if we as a team can, you know, be a little more consistent offensively when the quality of the arms we're facing is, is, is higher. Um, Because this past week I could even just see it on watching the stream UNF, Jacksonville, uh, the quality of their pitching is not at the same level that what we saw from UCF, guys like Chase Santala and those kind of guys. Um, So, yeah, I mean, ultimately, the next seven or eight games, we're not I don't think we are going to face any crazy uh, elite pitching staffs, but it should be definitely better quality pitching than you're going to see in a in a midweek stretch. So, um I actually am am looking forward to seeing how the offense responds on a weekend now where the the other team is more, you know, optimized for their pitching staff. So that's going to be good to see how we hit this weekend. And then uh, the last thing I'll say too, that you mentioned about uh, Tanner Mink. Um, Yeah. I think, you know, he's a fifth year senior in this program. He's one of, I think he's the only fifth year senior in the program right now. And um, so, yeah, I mean, he's been here. He knows the drill. Um, He's had two really good outings. He had two kind of so-so outings. Um, But uh, he's a veteran for this team that that is really good. Like you said, if we're going to go somewhere, he's going to be a part of it for sure. Because a fifth-year senior with his talent and his experiences, it's going to end up being a crucial, crucial, crucial piece. Um, But, yeah, that's all I kind of got. Yeah, I think uh, we're going to have a lot of questions answered this weekend. Uh, we've got a, a team that, like we said, they're they're pitching well right now. They're playing well. They're pretty hot. Um, and then I think UNC Greensboro is going to offer some unique challenges as well because perennially they're just a really good baseball school. So um, see how these guys respond to a little bit liver arms and uh, continue that prep for conference play and um, hopefully another run to – a regional, we can at least start with that, right? For sure, man, for sure.
Um, well, if that does if that does it for me, if, if you don't have anything else that, that wraps it up for another edition of Thirsty Thursday, uh, I'm John. I'm here with Mark. Go Bulls, and we'll see you at Thread this weekend. Go Bulls. And now we'll kick it over to Adam Cartwright with This Week in USF Softball. What's up, Bulls fans? This is Adam Cartwright here with your weekly softball report. Uh, last week, the Bulls were at a very successful week. Uh, they went 7-1 and one over eight games. Uh, these games included a doubleheaders victory over Stetson. and then included three wins uh, in the USF tournament, two over Louisville and one over Central Michigan. Uh, they did have one loss to Georgia Southern, but then they finished out uh, that set of games with a sweep of another doubleheader against Villanova. Some important stats over the weeks to kind of keep your eye on. Peyton Dixon went 3-1, and one, she had one save. Uh, she pitched 25 innings and had 34 strikeouts. Uh, she was complimented pretty well with Bell Sarja, who went 3-0 and oh with two saves and 18 strikeouts on the, on the set. Both of these two pitchers are ranking pretty high amongst conference uh, in terms of innings pitched, their first and second. Uh, Peyton Dixon... Uh, is second in ERA and strikeouts, and Bell Sarger actually ranks fourth in ERA, and she's tied uh, for the lead in uh, strikeout looking. So two very efficient, very well-accomplished pitchers uh, leading the USF staff. Uh, Peyton Dixon has also been awarded the American Athletic Conference uh, honor roll four straight weeks, uh, so she is off to a great start. They're also complemented very well by Lexi Kako, uh, who's kind of showing herself as a very solid third option coming out of the bullpen. Uh, she had a couple of appearances over this set of games that really helped. I know she ended up getting the win uh, against uh, the second game against Louisville uh, after a solid three innings out of the bullpen. Uh, really good to see from her. Uh, offensively, I think you're seeing a lot of rotation. Uh, when you look at the stats, there's only going to be five players that actually meet the minimum for plate appearances. That's because there's just a lot of players in and out. Uh, of the lineup, rotating players through, players playing different positions and so forth. But you are seeing a lot of players uh, getting a lot of playing time. As we move into the uh, the conference play, you might see a more consistent lineup start to emerge. Um, offensively, the girls are being led by um, Galagani, who's hitting 333, uh, by Alana Rivera, who's hitting two, 362, uh, and Olivia Elliott, who is hitting uh, 327. Also, over this set of games, Coach Erickson achieved his 1100th win, uh, which is outstanding. Uh, it, it's the most in the American Athletic Conference. Um, and so we just want to kind of highlight him for a second. Uh, after serving as an assistant to the legendary Hildred Dees, who won two consecutive ASA national championships with the Bulls in 83 and 84, Coach Erickson took over the program in 1997 and over the last 24 years, to go along with the wins, has amassed over or has amassed seven conference championships and 16 NCAA tournament appearances. Coach Erickson, you might, might know, is also a coach for Team USA, and in that capacity, he is a six-time World Cup uh, winner. So we just want to say congratulations to Coach Erickson, and we're blessed to have you running our softball program. Moving forward, uh, the Bulls will play a little bit lighter of a slate Coming up, they will welcome Charlotte to open conference play it's starting Friday uh, for a three-game set. Uh, and then after that, they will actually have their first road game of the year, which might be kind of interesting to think about, that you're actually going to have a conference game before your first road game. Uh, but they're actually going to travel down to Fort Myers and play a doubleheader, and that will happen on Monday. Well, I think that's all I have today. I hope you guys can make it out to support these girls. They are on fire right now. They are definitely looking like a team that's going to return to the NCAA tournament once again. Go Bulls.